Hey everybody, welcome back to the High Existence Podcast. This is Eric Brown, and I'm here today to speak with Dr. Heather Sanderson. She's a medical advisor at the Neurohacker Collective and the host of their podcast, Collective Insights. Heather also has her own integrative medicine practice and is operating an immersive care facility for the elderly. And with all of that, as you can guess, we dig into a lot in this episode. We jump from high-level views of the modern healthcare industry to exploring ways of unlocking elder wisdom in our aging populations, and of course, a deep dive into longevity, detoxing, biohacking, self-care, and just a whole lot more. Whether you're interested in how a doctor would redesign the healthcare system, or if you just want to know which tests are best for detoxing from heavy metals, we cover it all here. It was really an honor to have Heather with us, and the fountain of insights she shares here is really a testament to her expertise in holistic and integrative medicine. And before we begin, I just have something really quick to share with you. For those who have been with us for a while will know that we're good friends of the Neurohacker team. They are one of the only companies out there that every member of our team has supported and used products from. Last year, we actually stopped running ads on the High Existence blog entirely, and we've never run ads on this podcast. But because I love Neurohacker so much, I actually took the initiative to reach out to them directly and asked if there was anything they wanted to share with you. In their just classic and humble way, they said that the best thing they'd want and that I could do would be to share my own story, which I'll happily do. I'm a big fan of human potential, of tweaking our biological rhythms to unlock the best in us. And with that, you know, I've tried a bunch of wild and weird products and techniques as a result of that. And of course, this inevitably leads to trying out nootropics and all the classic brain boosters. Eventually, I stumbled into Qualia Mind, one of the flagship products from Neurohacker. We've actually written an article called The Real Life Limitless Pill, which I fully stand by. That's a very accurate name. Quali is a premium supplement designed to enhance both mental performance, so subjective, and brain health, objective. And it definitely delivers on that. I just felt like a hero on it. Extremely clear focus, clean, consistent energy levels, really quick word selection and sentence structure, and the drive to get everything done that I had on my list. It felt like it amplified the best parts of me. And so I wanted to give you guys all the chance to try it because it's real and one of the only products that myself and our team continue to use to this day. So if you're interested, head over to neurohacker.com and you can use the code EXISTENCE to get 15% off any product or order you make there. So thank you again. I'm really excited for this conversation and I hope you enjoy this deep dive with Dr. Heather Sanderson. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, This is Eric Brown. I'm here with a very special guest today, Dr. Heather Sanderson from a company that really, if you've been here for the past year or two, should need no introduction on on their part from the Neurohacker Collective. And she also has her own natural medicine practice with a, a, a resident care facility for the elderly as well. So Heather, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Eric. And I do want to give a little context to anyone who might be stumbling into Neurohacker or you for the first time. Again, I say they I say Neurohacker needs very little introduction here just because we've covered we've covered a lot of uh the team and some of the products products that come out from Neurohacker before. So if anyone wants a bit of background context before jumping into this conversation, on the podcast here, episode number seven and episode number 10, we have spoken with Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, R&D director, I believe, at Neurohacker before. We have an article up uh, discussing some of Jordan Hall's concepts, and we have a Qualia Mind review up, which is actually one of the only products that all members of our team continue to use to this day. It's really a fantastic piece there. And we also have a final article called How to Age Gracefully, both looking at that concept in general, and we're going to dig into that a bit today, but also looking at Eternus, um, one of their latest products focusing on anti-aging and longevity. So there's a lot. There's a lot here, uh, and we're going to cover... We're going to cover a lot of ground here. 
Um, I think just to start, and Heather actually also hosts the Collective Insights podcast, fantastic podcast uh, covering a lot on brain science, kind of just human performance and capability overall. So could you start us off with a bit of background on you, uh, kind of the work you do with Neurohacker and the work you do separately on your own? Sure, yeah. So I got into naturopathic medicine. Uh, I went to school at Bastyr University up in Seattle. And the reason I was interested in naturopathic medicine um, was because I, I grew up in Hawaii. And what I saw a lot of there was uh, basically the results of colonialism, right? There were my my co my fellow students in high school there were a lot of pacific islanders and they suffered with diabetes even in high school and there was a lot of violence in the homes um, their parents suffered many of them had lost parents at very young ages and here i was white and relatively privileged and our families were healthy and there was this huge disparity that was very apparent to me. And now this is a generalization, right? Not everyone was unhealthy that was Polynesian or Pacific Islander, but I could see it. I could experience it, that there was this huge gap in what was available to them versus what was available to me. And I realized very quickly that the the white community was able to mobilize. We were able to voice, you know, our opinions about development or about whatever the next thing that was coming down the pike in the community, whereas these communities didn't really have that access to that kind of power and that that sort of ability to share their minds and, and present a unified front. And so things just happened without them being able to engage. And then I traveled um, after undergrad and I saw this all over the world. And there was this night I was in Istanbul um, and I had this sort of epiphany that I'm sure other people have had as well, but like the, if you're not healthy, you really can't engage. You cannot make the difference that you may want to make in the world. You can't, you can't bring all your resources to the table because your only goal is to get through the day, right? Is to survive or if that, you know, your toe doesn't get amputated or that how do you pay for the medications or how do you get food? So realizing this, I decided that what I wanted to do was be the person who could help others become healthier so that they could then fully engage. And so that was why I ended up at Bastyr. And then um, soon after graduating, I ended up in San Diego and met Daniel. And Daniel was talking about a lot of these ideas and he was applying a, a systems, a complex systems model to medicine. And I had, you know, of course been influenced by naturopathic medicine and there's tenets of, of health and, and how we approach, you know, any sort of complex disease process. And then functional medicine is another one that's similar, but a little different. And then of course, complex or, or excuse me, conventional medicine has its own, you know, placebo controlled trials and this drug for that symptom. And then the Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, I had been exposed to as well as Ayurveda. So there's all these different ways to approach medicine. And Daniel, through his lens, there was this complex systems approach that said, okay, how can we put everything in here, use what's relevant, so put all of it in the bucket, and then take out the pieces that are most relevant for that person still say stay sane right and do it well and i was like i was a little overwhelmed and taken aback like wait what like yeah, somebody can do that that's possible and um in working with him i realized that it is it is and there's i never feel satisfied that i'm doing a good enough job right i'm always looking for the next person that's going to teach me that nugget that's going to help a patient who walks in my door and so i've really appreciated and always have been very grateful to be aligned with Daniel and the team at Neurohacker because they are thinking in this pretty unique way, especially for medicine, and very dedicated to getting it out there. Daniel and the creation of Neurohacker, really, it was about finding the things that are, are sorely needed, are really desperately needed in the space, but don't yet exist. And so that's where Qualia came from, right? That there are all these kids and, and even adults on modafinil or Vyvanse or, you know, the amphetamines and other stimulants. When we can do that naturally, we can do that in a way that doesn't create addiction. We can, we can help optimize people's focus and attention and, and capacity without a, an amphetamine. And so, um, and 
you know, Qualia, of course, is the manifestation, the first manifestation of that. Eternus is another one. Um, but really, the goal is to find what's missing from the space and plug the hole with really, really good, high quality content or a product. Yeah. And so that's what we're here for. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. There's a term that's become more and more popularized. Um, I think Elon Musk really shot it, shot it into the common vocabulary that of first principles like really starting at first principles and we run we run a retreat series here as well and something i bring up to people the the way i like to present it is like before you think that your life is in shambles and you have a lot of anxiety and you're really depressed like do you drink enough water every day like do you actually sleep do you see the sun more than two hours a week like I'm not I'm not trying to discount your your problems or your perceived problems but like make sure you get the foundations done first. And actually one of the first ways I was introduced to neurohacker was the the foundations of neurohacking PDF. There's a beautiful like 20 some odd page PDF that was released and what I loved about that is that it had foundations it's it was very much an 80 20 approach like are you actually sleeping before you figure out the temperature your room should be in your fancy non-hypoallergenic pillow like get the basics down and starting from that from that space is a i think correct and b i think extremely important and before we dive too much into that can you also touch on some of your practices that you have on your own oh personally yeah, well, okay, so this morning um, I get up, or well, I have an 18 month old daughter, so she, she gets me up early. And um, I drink 32 ounces of water as soon as I get up, so before anything else. Um, and I just recently started drinking caffeine in the form of matcha. It's never been something I was into, it makes me a little jittery. Um, but I do, matcha has just so many great health benefits that, um, and I do, I'll admit, I like that little caffeine buzz. Um, so I have my matcha with, um, colostrum and some cinnamon and, um, some coconut milk. And then I start my day. Um, I do meditate every day for about 20 minutes and I, I have found that guided meditations are best for me. So I make a point to do that and I, I should be more consistent about when it is and do it at the same time every day, but I get it in before bed. Sometimes I fall asleep doing it. Let's be real, but <laughs> it gets in there. Um, so my foundations, I always get eight hours of sleep. I probably need nine. And then my baby, it, that has impacted my sleep. So I really, really prioritize sleep. And then exercise. I, I'm a runner, so I... I run, um, I aim for 20 miles a week. <laughs> sometimes I get there, sometimes I don't. But I try to, what works best for me is to have a goal, to have something to shoot for. So I either sign up for a half marathon or a triathlon, or I decide I'm gonna go do something ridiculous like hike Mount Shasta with a friend. And then I um, and then I have to, you know, be. I'm training for something essentially, and that keeps me motivated. So I found that that's what works for me. Motivational interviewing. I'm sure you're familiar with this concept. Um, so with patients, sometimes it's really different. Sometimes it's something social that will drive them. Sometimes it's actually being alone. There are a lot of. Sometimes it's their body and the way they look. You know, there's a lot of different things that drive our own behavior. But when we know what it is, we can sort of hack it, right? And for me, it's. Um, that that future goal that I have to work for that keeps me on it so I usually try to have something like that on the books yeah and that's such an important point I think sometimes we lose we lose sense of the fact that humans are like goal-oriented creatures basically an example I love to bring up is um, something I heard about PhD students where you work for several years on your big dissertation you submit it and you know in the weeks that follow something that should be like an amazing milestone in your life and you're super excited about it, there's actually an increase in, in kind of depressive symptoms after because mm -hmm. now your your massive overarching umbrella goal is now gone and you're in that, it's an open potential state, right? You can, you can definitely, it's a great place to be in, 
but without that without a goal to work towards we tend to be somewhat aimless so i think there's deep wisdom in actually oh i know that exercise is important well can i actually have some sort of a marker some sort of a and it's completely arbitrary right it can be up to you to set but so long as you have something set to work towards it's extremely helpful progress yeah that just the fact that we're always making progress i think is what keeps a lot of people sane um and whether that goal is small it's just today or if it's 10 years five years but setting those goals i think that's why it's a practice in so many traditions right is to write them down figure out what it is you want get really clear about that and then and then get get on it one foot in front of the other yeah and you brought up you brought up something uh, in your first share that I really want to dig into because I think it was a very important point, which is, you know, there's there's part of your, your work as medical advisor to Neurohacker that's a very data-driven, scientific, clinical approach, right? Neurohacker's really pushing a lot of that, a lot of that work. And at the same time, without a skip of a beat, you also have a natural medicine clinic, right? And I think for many of us, or for many people, there's this black and white either or uh, mentality like oh you're either in the clinical space or you're either in the natural medicine space um, but you also brought up examples of like well what's the best parts of um, like eastern medicine that we can pull in do you do you view any dichotomy here well no I, i'm it's kind of a whatever works sort of thing and also you know what's practical I think that that gets separated a lot. Um, you know, if a, if a medication is tens of thousands of dollars, it's not accessible to everyone. And so what can we do instead of that? that that's not an option, right? And you can have all the placebo controlled randomized trials that you want, but if people can't get it because they don't have insurance or they don't have the cash to pay for it, then it's not an option. And so we, we haven't solved the problem, right? And the the medicine that I do doesn't always fit into these paradigms. Um, and we actually at my clinic are doing a trial. It's a um, it's a prospective trial where we're taking a cohort of 25 patients through our approach to dementia. So using an individualized um, and integrated approach to that based on on what we know. But we're not going to use one intervention, right? That that's sort of when we come to a complex disease process, the causes are not mutually exclusive. Just because you have an imbalance in nutrients doesn't also mean that you have had a traumatic brain injury, right? You can have both. And so we need to treat both if we're really going to get resolution of, of the disease process. And so we need to be able to have that flexibility and I think it feels like common sense, right? If you address more of the problems, you're going to get a better outcome. But that's not how science approaches these, these diseases. And it's not for lack of money. It's not because there's a lack of smart people, right? It's just sort of what we're told is the best approach. And I would argue that with the rates of disease in, in the U.S., certainly, I don't know, Canada is probably a little different. There's a lot of different variables, right, with having like medicine, having insurance available to everyone. There's there's so many variables we couldn't even discuss them all. But certainly in the U.S., people are sicker than ever before. Right. And and we spend more money than anyone else. And so it's not a lack of money. There's something else missing. And I think that it's the way that we approach it. It's not a holistic approach from the conventional perspective. And they do great, right? Like if I get in a car accident, please take me to the nearest emergency room, right? Like, but if someone has dementia or diabetes or anxiety or depression, a pill is not going to fix that. It really needs to be a holistic approach where we do. We take everything from every system of medicine that exists and we pull in the best pieces that are accessible to that person right so one person may be willing to change their diet one person may be able to exercise and another might not so we have to use the the components that work for that person it allergies right like there might be an ayurvedic herb that i think will be great for someone's blood pressure but if they have an allergy to it they can't do it right so having that conversation and having the space available to have those conversations and create an individualized approach for that patient 
One thing that I feel so lucky to be able to do at my clinic is have longer conversations with people. It's not a seven minute visit or a 15 minute visit. It's an hour and a half the first time we meet. And then I really aim to keep it at an hour for follow-ups because there's so much to discuss. Um, and we do, I, I would feel like I was doing a patient a disservice if I was trying to rush through all of those decisions. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad. I'm glad you you gave voice to that because these, you know, you are a, you're an organism, you're a full unit, and it's actually, there is there is benefit and there is purpose, but you know the nature of science is to isolate, extract, and examine, right? Actually dig into the isolating things, and you know to the point where you can't have influence from external factors, right? It has to be temperature controlled. Maybe it can't see the light. Maybe it has to be kept in the tube. The whole point being engagement with external factors messes up the sample. And yet you can't ever take the person out from the external factors, right? You're always in relationship to your environment, to the other people, to the, you know, nature or lack of nature around you. And so there's, it's a both end. It's always a both end. Let's take the, the best of what we know, match it to who you are and what we think would work best and find something Find something that we can move forward with. An example I like here is uh, talk therapy. Like if you go see a psychotherapist, you know, they, on the surface, it's just a conversation that you're having, right? But they're actually employing a bunch of techniques and probing questions and they, they actually have a system. But at the end of the day, you, you don't know or care what they're doing. You actually just care that you're feeling better and growing as a result of it, right? Like that's that should be the... That should be our aim at the end of the day. Is there is there tangible improvement coming up? And I was looking through your your bio, and there was a on the Neurohacker site, and there was a there was a sentence that really just activated my whole system. That I'd love I'd love for you to speak to a bit, which you did a bit here, kind of that of personalized medicine. And the the sentence was utilizing blood work and diagnostics to create custom stacks. It's coming down the pike for for NHC. Um, yeah, can you speak to the importance more? I actually, because I want to drill this, I want to drill into this for people of not taking a one size fits all approach. Though there are best practices, we really need to take people as as an individual unit. Yeah. So let's take dementia for example, or cognitive decline. You know, we spend so much time at Neurohacker focusing on optimization, and I think sometimes it's easier to watch what's going on when there's actual decline and you can certainly measure it right when when we're when we're 35 years old and talking about optimization it's it's difficult to put a number to it but when we're 65 and our memory is declining then we can really see what's going on um so in the in the model that i use for dementia we basically go back to what are all of the potential causes. Again, so we want to be as inclusive as possible. And Dr. Bredesen, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who is a formal mentor of mine, um, he wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. And the reason I was so drawn to him is because Daniel and I, more Daniel than me, but Daniel has applied this complex systems approach to medicine. And basically what we say is if you have a complex chronic disease, there's five things that can be causal. So we can talk about your hormones, but those are going to be secondary. What are the primary causes? We can talk about inflammation, but that's going to be secondary. Something else caused inflammation. So the five primary causes are imbalance. And imbalance, we could we could apply this to any complex system, right? Financial systems, educational systems, public health systems, like whatever you want to talk about. An imbalance is going to cause an issue. There's going to be a, essentially a disease. So in the case of the human body, an imbalance in toxicity, an imbalance in nutrients, an imbalance in structure, an imbalance in stress, or an imbalance in microorganisms or infection are going to be the five primary causes of any complex chronic disease process. And it, you know, structure I, in there, I would include both genetic structure, so molecular structure, and then the way like your orthopedist or chiropractor might think about it. Are you getting enough blood flow? Are you getting good nerve conduction? So, and I would argue that essentially any of the things that we talk about in my office boil down to something in those categories. So Dr. Bredesen has a very similar 
um, approach to it. And he says, all right, there's six different paths that you can take to dementia. And our job is to figure out what path you took so that we can take you back, right? And he talks about toxicity. He talks about nutrients um, in the form of glycotoxicity, so an imbalance in sugar, and then hormones, imbalances in hormones. Um, structure, he talks about that from the traumatic, so traumatic TBIs or traumatic brain injuries can certainly cause dementias. So he's got his list that fits very nicely with our list. And um, when a person comes into my office, the first thing I want to do is identify what path were you on? What was it that brought you to this decline that that created this complex chronic disease process and then unravel it so if i've and i can't tell you how many times this has happened but another a patient will come into my office and they've seen another doctor who's told them look it's all inflammation take a bunch of curcumin take a bunch of fish oils and you'll probably get better and I look at their labs and I'm like, but you never had an elevated CRP. There's nothing. You never had low fish oils. Like everything looked good. This isn't an inflammatory process. And then we talk and I say, hey, have you ever hit your head? Oh, yeah. When I was in college, I was playing football and I think I got a couple concussions. But, you know, I just got back up. And then we can start to put the pieces together and, oh, yeah, no, nobody's ever really mentioned my testosterone or my estrogen or progesterone. So I've seen this where a doctor and we're all doing the best we can with the information we have. Right. But what I saw over and over again before I met Daniel was doctors who would pick a a favorite, right? Everybody's got candida. And so we've got to treat candida in everyone. Or, you know, everyone's got Lyme or everyone's got mold or everyone's, you know, got EBV. And my my goal is really to say, okay, you might have EBV or you might have candida or there might be an imbalance in, in you might have leaky gut. But I don't think everybody does or SIBO is another one that comes up over and over. So let's test. Let's test for all of those things and see what's really happening. And then we can create a plan that is specific to your imbalances. And really the goal is to create balance because our bodies are these divine designed just incredible it like it gives me goosebumps right like this it's so amazing what our bodies are capable of and they are all designed to heal and if we just get the shit out of the way they do it miraculously so it is complex and it, it can be feel complicated and certainly overwhelming particularly when you don't feel good but if we distill it down and get it into this model it's so doable yeah yeah this is oh this is extremely close to my heart uh, that of your body actually knows how to heal. And when we say that, when we map that to the mind, somehow there's always a record scratch that like doesn't quite connect. But like if you scrape your knee, like it's not like you sit and devote conscious effort to healing your knee. Like your body does it, right? Returning to the homeostasis, returning to balance is the natural ability of your body. And to your point, like sometimes it can be a matter of adding more doing something correct but often it can be like getting out of our own way stop doing the thing that's holding us back you know the <laughs> the way i like to present this is like basic algebra there's two ways to move in a positive direction it's adding positive stuff or it's subtracting negative and it might be easier for many of us to subtract negative things before because you know new habits behaviors whatever are difficult to add on but it can be easier sometimes to actually just cut things out or stop doing them so there's two ways two ways that we can get to the same result here um and one thing again that is super important and none of this is to to discount anyone's situation but the way i like to phrase it is i guess i don't want to say the basic mental illness the the common i think mental illness is things like anxiety stress depression I, I like to think of them as a warning signal there's an alarm going off right it's like ooh, to your point something is off there's an imbalance somewhere and i'm actually letting you know like your body's doing you a big favor here but all we try to do is stop the alarm rather than you know the gas leak or whatever that's actually causing the alarm to go off and so any practices or any uh yeah, any services that help move us in the direction of what is the generator function to steal something I got from Daniel? What is the root cause that's mm -hmm. actually generating this? Because, you know, no one wants to necessarily be on 
like the hamster wheel of medicine where you're always just coming back to the beginning you're always just maintaining and it's always still there because it can also be very I don't want to say demoralizing but it, it can, oh it's absolutely demoralizing yeah yeah and in my practice I seen patients walk in and they tell me these stories of all of the doctors that they've seen and how they don't feel like they've gotten help. It is, it is so demoralizing. And then what do we do about it? Right? Cause we can't stay stuck in that. And so, like you said, foundations, how many times have I talked to someone with anxiety and they're drinking a two, three cups of coffee every morning, which is not helpful. Then they stay up late at night. So they're not getting enough sleep. Then they've got to get up to an alarm. They're not getting any exercise. I mean, not everyone is in this category. There's a lot of people who take really good care of themselves and then still have anxiety. And so then we go back to those foundational pieces. Excuse me. We cover the foundational pieces, make sure they're there. And then we go back to the model of what are the causal factors? What are these generating forces? And toxicity can cause a ton of anxiety imbalances in structure can cause a ton of anxiety so is there a genetic component are you are you metabolizing in a certain way so i use dr bill walsh's work he wrote a book called nutrient power and has collected tens of thousands of individuals data over the course of decades and really has the largest mental health database on the planet and he uses nutrients in a very relatively simple, relatively inexpensive way, we can shift the neurotransmitter balances in our brain. And there was a young boy who I saw, he was about 12 when I first saw him. I think he's 17 now. Um, he came in and his mom had to go to school with him every day. If, he, if his mom left the classroom, he would lose his mind and go home with her. She had to sit there every day in order for him to go to school. He had horrible um, social anxiety and um, attachment kind of things going on and um, separation anxiety, excuse me. And so he was... I mean, he wasn't getting to go to Boy Scout camps. He wasn't, you know, he was totally missing out on all of these really fun things. And he could see that. He could see that he was missing it and he wanted his brain to be working differently. So he came in, we did the testing and then we put him on a plan. And a few weeks later he came back and he said, Hey doctor, have you ever seen a little old lady with a big dog? And it's kind of more like the dog is walking her. And I was like, yeah, Jake, where's this going? And he's like, that's how my brain used to feel. And now I feel like I'm walking my dog. Kids sometimes say it in like the most profound ways. They do a better job than adults nine times out of 10. Um, but, and mom helped so much, right? He was really on the program because mom was so dedicated to helping him. But he really distilled kind of that idea for me that sometimes even as much as you try, as much as you put those foundational pieces in place, if your biochemistry is not balanced, it's not working in your favor, then it can feel like your mind is controlling you. And so, and then, you know, I, whenever someone tells me about family history of addiction of whether it's alcoholism or other drugs, I have so much compassion for that individual. Like they were really just uncomfortable and didn't feel good. And so they were looking to self-medicate and the best they knew how or what was available to them was alcohol, right? And it, it gave them a little bit of relief. And if we can do that in a, in a way that's, you know, I'm going to say, quote unquote, natural, it's not necessarily natural if we're using a bunch of synthetic, even if they're nutrients, right? But um, if we can do that in a way that's balancing rather than just triggering some different imbalance or an addiction, then we can really get some sustained change that that can help someone, like I said, like just be able to fully engage, be able to fully show up, be able to fully participate and share their gifts with the world, which is, that's the goal, balance and, and that engagement. Yeah. And, and, uh, I've certainly been a big fan of some of Gabor Mate's work coming out around addiction and uh, right. The, the realm of hun hungry ghosts and, you know, your, your note on actually just a default to compassion struck, struck really struck a chord because it's like you know again to your point earlier of we're actually just all trying to do our best both the medical field and the individuals at large like many many individuals are actually conscious of this right they're actually like yeah this is definitely not ideal but my my perception of the options available are limited and then in doing this i actually do limit my options and it and that's this uh 
that's how you get into something like a downward spiral. The options just keep limiting on what you can do and what the world has for you, and then you're stuck. You're stuck in that loop. But that that doesn't mean that given a given a perfect world, you'd uh, you'd choose that. You know, the the almost reflexive example here is the rat park experiment, where you know rats in a <laughs> um, rats when put in an empty cage and given the choice between water and cocaine, always choose cocaine until they die. But if you put them in, you know, rat wonderland, when they have friends and beautiful scenery and all of this, right, they just go back to water and everything is fine. And it's like a lot of these studies, it's easy to actually like shove that off, be like, yeah, whatever, it was a rat. But it's it's true. When we can create the basic conditions for human flourishing, things sort themselves out mm-hmm. <laughs> as we... As we like as we covered and it is really a matter of what are these and can we move towards them effectively yeah and at some level it has to happen at a higher level right like we can all make our individual decisions and do the best we can with you know create having a home a healthy home or getting exercise and yet if society continues to drive efficiency and you know we're just skating this really fine line of getting as much done as fast as we can and producing as much as possible that is not a recipe for mental health right Uh, and so it's both and that really i believe that at some point the societal drivers need to shift um I mean, even social media, there's so many things again here that we could talk about. The list would be very, very long. But what we value as a society needs to change if everyone's mental health is going to shift. And, and we see this, right? We, there are higher rates of diagnoses of mental health disorders, more prescriptions being written every day. The trend is not going down. We're not solving this problem. It is only getting worse. And you know, like you said, if anxiety is a signal to us, to us as an individual, that something is out of balance, then these rates of mental health need to be a signal to society that something is out of balance on a, on a much higher level. Um, those, that indication, it's, it's terrifying to me. And I, I'm really hopeful that people like Daniel, um, hopefully I'm contributing at some level in my clinic. Um, that's really, you know, again, goes back to my why is like, it, there are so many issues on the planet, right? Whether we're talking about like rhinoceros in Africa or the plastic problem in the Pacific Ocean or the glaciers melting, like whatever it is, somebody needs to solve these problems. And and my hope is that if I can help people be healthier, then they will show up and help solve those problems. So the game changers are are really, um, I always get excited when someone comes into my office and I ask them about their work and what they're doing. And they're like, well, I'm really hoping I started this nonprofit and I'm helping, you know, girls who have been affected by sexual abuse or sexual trauma. And they're, you know, I have all these women who are doing so great. And so I feel very fulfilled. I'm like, all right, you need to be healthy because you need to go help a hundred thousand more of those girls. Right. So, um, I hope that this medicine that I offer can be helping those game changers, really everyone. But that's what's most important to me. What keeps me up at night and gets me up in the morning is that, that uh, and that a part of also why I want to help the elderly. We had been talking about this a little bit before we started recording, but the elderly are at their height of their wisdom and experience. They are at the height of what they have to give to the world. And if they fall out of society and are no longer able to contribute, not only does that add to their mental health imbalance, right? Contributing and being part of, we're social creatures, being part of a group, being part of a, a, a progress, right? Um, allowing your gifts to be shared with the world is so essential to ha- having good mental health status. So if we take our elderly as they start to decline out of society they and, and put them in a home where they just watch TV and eat ice cream and cookies, then we're, we're really starving society of that wisdom and experience. And so I'm hopeful that the work that I'm doing and that the group similar to mine are doing um, will shine a light on what we can do about cognitive decline and bring them back bring them back into society so that they can share all of that and, and help us with the plastic problem and, you know, all of these imbalances in, in the world. Wow, there was a lot there. 
Yeah, and and this is this is actually how we originally connected because um, I think on Dialogues Two, if anyone's listened to that on this podcast, um, I was I was posed the question of what is something that we may have lost as society has evolved because we've gained so much and you know that's a that's a given. But was there anything that we lost? And immediately my two answers were the rite of passage, the the clear delineation of an individual moving from child to adult and being able to step into adult responsibilities. And the one I riffed on longer and I think is more alive for me right now is that of, well, we've lost like the council of elders. We've lost a, a, a group in collectives that actually steward us forward because in many ways like they don't have a lot of skin in the game anymore right they can't reproduce they're they're not taking on the the ma- major jobs or roles so they're actually like their only their only goal here is to just keep the thing going and and steward us forward as effectively as possible and yet when either uh those groups actually just leave right they just all move to florida and kind of check out or which I, I think I, I want to dig in more with you on this, is it actually gets locked up inside of them where they're forgetting it or they can't communicate it. You know, it, it may as well be lost, right? They're, <laughs> the way I said it before our call was like, they're, they're like libraries of Alexandria being lost continuously, year over year, just because it can't go from their inner world out. Um, given the kind of foundation we've laid in this conversation, is there how do you approach something like that? Like, what do you actually do to combat dementia or Alzheimer's both? And and maybe there are two answers here, both for individuals who are already of that age and might be experiencing that, but also like, you know, I'm approaching 30. Like, is there something that I should be thinking about things that I can put in place to actually have a much longer tail effect on that? Yeah, so it's a lot of what we've already talked about, right? Those foundations, so sleep, good sleep hygiene, um, exercise, getting plenty of vigorous exercise, um, eating a diet, a healthy diet, right? So getting the process stuffed out. And I don't, I don't believe that there's one right diet for any one disease or one right diet for everyone, even if that individual finds the right diet for their 30s, it might be different for their 40s, or it might be different in the winter. But finding a diet that is l- absolutely low in processed foods, right? That is consistent. Um, so having whole foods, and by that I mean it looks like it just came out of the ground, off the tree, or straight from the animal. Um, so sleep, exercise, diet, digestion I put in here. Um everyone should be having a bowel movement every day. If you're not, then you're not getting enough of the toxins out and drinking enough water, right? That Focus on on that detox. So our, our natural detox organs, our skin and lymph, our bowels, our kidneys, our liver and our lungs, making sure that we're taking a minute every day to let all of those work, that all of them function, that we're not suppressing sweat, that we are having a bowel movement, that we are getting plenty of water, that we take those nice deep breaths. Um, all of those things are so vital. And whenever I see a patient who has had long-term constipation or doesn't remember the last time they sweat, I, my the bulb always goes off and I'm like, ding, ding, ding. Okay, so we really need to focus on getting that person you know, back into healthy detox because even every cell eats and poops every day, right? Like, so I'm not even talking about, of course, we live in a relatively toxic world, but just every single cell has some metabolic waste that we need to be able to get rid of. And if for whatever reason we've suppressed that, then we're going to end up at a state of imbalance. So taking care of all of those foundational things early on will prevent so much disease and not just dementias, but everything else, right? When we're talking about balance in the human body, it's what's nice, right? It makes us all a little simpler, but you're preventing diabetes. You're, you're preventing hypertension. You're preventing cancer. You're preventing all of these things when we, when we aim for balance earlier on. The other really big one that we've been talking about through this whole conversation is stress. So what drives you the questions I typically ask my patients are your relationships. Do you have good, healthy relationships, whether that's a romantic relationship or with your parents or your siblings, friends? Do you have that social support? We are social creatures and we need that at some level. Then two, usually work. Um, so 
that can also be school or sense of purpose. Like you mentioned the PhD student, right? Like what is your, what's driving you? What progress are you making? What, what are you passionate about? And then um, your home. So it can be very stressful for someone if they don't have a solid home, a foundation, a place to go back to. If they're constantly moving or if they're in the middle of a renovation, that can be extremely stressful. So understanding those components and, and really maybe biting off one at a time if you have the ability to do that. Uh, and trauma is the other thing. So people who have experienced especially early childhood trauma, whatever it means to make peace with that for you, um, that becomes priority number one, typically when I'm talking to someone and, and maybe, you know, at the same time as other things, depending on what's going on. But making peace with that childhood trauma is so, so important to it i've watched over and over again people with early childhood trauma seem to be much much more susceptible to long-term chronic diseases like autoimmune disease like lyme and mold susceptibility so taking care of that and creating that that cellular i think i i believe what's happening is that the the nervous system the brain is sending a signal that i'm in trouble or i need to be protected i'm at risk and so if your cells are constantly getting that signal then they're going to behave that way and so changing that neurological signaling through, there's lots and lots of people who do this. Um, Joe Dispenza is one who can guide people through that. There's a DNRS is another um, one. Um, Sa- Gupta um, has another one. So there's a lot of different processes you can take. And then people find this on their own, whether it's through religious practices or other meditative practices. Psychedelics can be very helpful. Um, but finding that peace with whatever your trauma is, is really, really important. And I think those are all things that all of us can do in our thirties. Right. And then, yeah. And then later on, what we do is we go through, okay, where did it go wrong? Right. So we do all the lab testing, we look for toxins. And in my practice right now, we can look for, I think of them as ice cream flavors, three different flavors of toxins, heavy metals, um, our chemical toxins, and we just look at a little a smattering of these. Um, we can't look for all 80,000 or whatever odd toxins exist in the environment, but we look at a handful like the petrochemicals and then kind of the personal care products, the pesticides and herbicides. So we look through a, a few different categories and see if anything is popping up there. And then the mycotoxins or mold toxins um, are another common one. And we can test all of those and then we can specifically go after them. I, of course, look at um, your a blood panel, a very thorough blood panel, where we're going to look at deeply into thyroid, into hormones, sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, um, prolactin levels. There's a lot of things that can, sex hormone binding globulin, that can be drivers and imbalance there, um, particularly all, all of the other things that we've all already talked about. But then, of course, as people age, the hormonal fluctuations can, can start to add to problems. And so balancing that out can be very protective. Um, and then nutrient levels. So nutrients, again, can be one of these primary imbalances, things like vitamin D. Of course, vitamin D is actually more a hormone, but that can help to be one of the trophic factors that continues to have our, our bones be healthy and our brain healthy. Um, other B vitamins and minerals, antioxidant levels, all of these things are so essential to each of our cells functioning. And that's, that's the, the premise of Eternus, um, is to make sure that there's enough nutrients for our mitochondria to work really efficiently. And as we age, we tend to build up some of these toxins. We tend to build up these stressors and that neurological programming. And so our nutrients don't get used as efficiently. So it's kind of like this muck in the system so that maybe you have enough vitamin C or you have enough copper, or you have enough of whatever it is, but it's not used efficiently. So effectively, you don't have enough, right? We need to get you a little bit more so that all of those processes can work a little better. So um, basically, we just go back to that model of, all right, how are the toxins there? Can we get rid of them? Are there nutrients? Are there enough nutrients at a functional level, not just at an RDA level, not just what's your recommended daily allowance from, you know, the powers that be is, but is it really enough for you? And then are there, are there big stressors? What can we do to address them and allow you to make peace with them? And is there an infectious burden? And that infectious burden can, can be is usually like long-term chronic things, but the mouth is a place that I always look to. Um, and I refer out to a dentist, 
But if there are root canals or dental infections, history of dental infections, or those people who the trauma happened at the dentist, um, and so they never want to go, um, you know, they've got an, they know they have an infection that they haven't dealt with. That again becomes one of the first things I want to have happen because I, I would have thought you were crazy if you had told me this in medical school. But I have seen it over and over again where someone deals with a dental infection and their autoimmune disease resolves or their their Crohn's resolves um, overnight essentially. Now. I'll say it, not everyone with Crohn's or not everyone with an autoimmune disease has a tooth pulled or has a dental infection worked on and it goes away. But I've seen it a handful of times now that it, it's really driven home that dental infections and dental imbalances can be a primary driver of disease. And we can see in autopsies of people with who have had dementia that many times those organisms are in the brain. Um, and associated with these neurofibrillary tangles and the beta amyloid plaques. In fact, as we learn more about dementia and Alzheimer's in particular, we've realized that these beta amyloid plaques are, are actually there to protect us. They're there to wall off these diseases. They have antimicrobial properties. So it, it's, it's there to protect us from the toxicity or the infection that's snuck its way into our brains. So getting rid of that perturbation, getting rid of the toxin, getting rid of the infection means that you don't have to create beta amyloid plaques, which means you don't end up with Alzheimer's, right? So um, kind of a rethinking of, of what's going on there. Well, actually, this is protective. This process, again, it goes back to that divine design that this process of creating beta amyloid plaques isn't to cause dementia. It's to protect us from the things that actually cause dementia. And if we address those things, then we can get full resolution. Wow, that's huge. Actually, I didn't. I didn't know that the. I, I knew, again, at a at a basic level, that the plaque was sometimes a driver or a, a byproduct. I didn't actually know it was a defense mechanism from your body. That's that's amazing. There's yeah, it's kind of sorry. I just want to add that what we see in the literature. So what's been coming out, like I said, billions of dollars have been spent finding, trying to find drugs to combat Alzheimer's. And in the U.S. alone today, there's I think 5.6 between 5.5 and 6 million people with diagnosed Alzheimer's. And by 2025, it's expected to be 10 million people diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Now, one in three people in the U.S. complains about cognitive decline. Or, or brain fog, maybe some people call it. So this is epidemic, right? This is a massive problem that will bankrupt Medicare in the U.S. And what they've, so there's a lot of money being thrown at this, a lot of smart people looking at it. And the goal has been to reduce the beta amyloid plaques. And that they've done it over and over and over again. And they're using monoclonal antibody. I mean, it just goes on and on the super smart things that it seems they're doing. What they found in these trials, they've had to actually stop them early because when you reduce the beta amyloid plaques, people's cognitive decline gets worse. And it makes sense if you use this model, but it's not the conventional model. People are blaming the beta amyloid plaques when in fact they're there to protect us. And, and this plays out in the literature when, when you see that they're having to stop these trials early because the disease is actually getting worse because you've re removed the protective mechanism. And you know you would think that the model would then shift but on the conventional side, it's it's slow going. It, it's not fully shifting. So, you know, that's why we're doing what we can on our end to to show this integrative, individualized approach um, can, really can do it. That's astounding, actually. That that's remarkable that it, it gets worse and then the studies get cut. Um, geez, yeah. I I think the I think the shift from reactive medical care to preventative medical care will be one of the highest leverage moves we can make period for you know to your point everything if you have a capable collective any problem can be solved basically but it's it rests on the foundation of the capable collective mm -hmm. now there's one thing i want to give some voice to just because it seems to be such a gray area there seems to be so much fog around it which is that of detoxing you know, even when you say that word to a lot of people, it, it just carries so much ambiguous baggage with it. The way the way I hear it presented commonly in kind of the world that I'm in is one of two ways. One is a kind of, well, my body does it anyways, so it's not really, it's not real. Like, 
your your body just has processes and like it does whatever. You don't need to actually detox, right? The the whole there's just a push against the whole term. Or then you get the other side, which is you know, you don't really do it enough, you don't do it well enough, so I need a 14-day juice cleanse to do the super detox or buy some ambiguous white label thing that is filled with all these random cleansers that I don't even know what they do, but it says detox cleanse, so it's amazing and it's absolutely what I need to be doing. Where do you sit on all of this? Like, how do you, how do you view detox? So again, I go back to this individualized approach, right? Some people have a bunch of parasites in their gut and we can test this and we can see it. And if it, you know, if you've been in Bali last summer and you had a gut bug and you never looked at what was there and you still have diarrhea, then like, let's test it. Let's see what's there because it might be, you know, you might have Giardia. You might, and I, I see that. I see that in my, in my clinic. Um, so you know, and that's a very different quote unquote detox than if you have, if you are 65 and you grew up at a time where you had a ton of metal amalgams in your mouth and you ate a ton of fish and there was lead in the fuel and, you know, you were exposed, there was lead in the paint. So you were exposed to a lot of these things because of your generation. Often I, I see people who were raised in India or in South or Central America, there was lead in the fuel for a lot longer than there was in the U.S. And their lead levels actually reflect that. They're, they're quite high. I, I, it's, it's very common in, um, you know, people 60, 65 and older, and particularly those raised overseas. So... Uh, you know, our, our exposures are different. It depends who you are, what type of detox is most appropriate for you. And so I would recommend that people work with a provider usually. Now, if you've had constipation for decades, then, you know, your body is not detoxifying well, right? If you don't sweat, then your body is not detoxifying well. If you sit at a chair all day and you don't really breathe deeply, your body is not detoxifying well, right? We use a breathalyzer, cops use a breathalyzer to tell if someone's been drinking because we exhale out the, a lot of the toxin. And our breath is how we get rid of a ton of toxicity. It's how we manage our, the pH of our body. So there's so much power in the breath. I don't know if you've ever been in, a, in like a yoga breath class um, where you can start to smell the toxin coming out of people's bodies. It's pretty intense. Um, I remember one of the first ones I went to, I was like, who's painting? It's like 8 p.m. Why is there someone painting outside the like outside of this yoga studio? And I realized after a bit that it was just somebody was detoxing that that really intense chemical smell. And we see that all the time. So you can turn up your body's ability to detoxify in a very thoughtful way and I, I do recommend doing it with a provider. You know, I think really what you're talking, what you're speaking to when you said, oh, I've got this thing online that it ha says it's for detox. People feel different. And that's why there's so many detox things available online that are thriving, right? Is if you do a detox, you typically feel pretty different afterwards. And so what's going on there? I think sometimes people are probably withdrawing from sugar and processed foods that they're addicted to. And so just getting up over that addiction and that that withdrawal period, all of a sudden you feel clearer. And so there's that piece. Sometimes that's what's going on. Sometimes you're getting rid of parasites. Sometimes you're getting rid of heavy metals. One of the big cautions I would have is that you can go too fast. And so if someone starts to detoxify and they feel worse, which I think sometimes is the argument, like, why would I do that? My body does this on its own. And if I ever do that, it makes me feel like crap. So why would I do it? Well, probably means that you're really toxic. And what you need to do is just go slowly. So any type of like Herxheimer reaction or um, detox reaction that people have where they end up with rashes or headaches or joint pain or something like that, I would then step in and say, let's slow down. Let's go at the pace that your body can tolerate because we're probably doing cellular damage if we go too quickly. We're, what's happening is you're mobilizing it from the cellular level. You're mobilizing or getting the toxins out of the cell. Now it's in your blood and now it can wreak havoc in more places in the body because we're not keeping up with the elimination. You're not, you're not having the bowel movements. You're not urinating it out. You're not sweating it out. 
fast enough to keep up with what's being released from the cell. So yeah, with, I don't, does that answer your question around toxins and, and detox? It's, it's relatively complex. And again, it, it needs to be individualized. Yeah, I, I, I think we got to a place that I was hoping for, which is kind of, well, there's balance to this too. It's a real thing. You do actually detox stuff. There are things you can do that assist with that, but it can also be done improperly. There's a Absolutely. There's a right and wrong way to do it. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. And unfortunately, we live in a relatively toxic world, right? Mm -hmm. So I do believe that we need to try harder than our ancestors to continue to get those things out. Um, so you know, to, to have lots of fiber in your diet and to be making sure again, that those among trees are organs of elimination to just like check that's so essential. Those are those foundations, making sure that you are having that bowel movement, that you are sweating, that you are moving so that you can get your lymph flowing, that all those things are happening for you on a daily basis is absolutely essential. And if it's not, then you probably are toxic because we get exposed to a lot. Yeah, so th this is almost a personal question that I have because it's, I'm not sure if I'm 100% on it and I'd like a more educated opinion on it. That of how fasting, intermittent or multi-day can come into this. The the way I kind of off the cuff say it sometimes is like, I've had some conversations just about fast with friends and I feel amazing. I love doing them, um, you know, within reason. Uh, but I was talking with a friend the other day and he was like, well, yeah, but I don't want to stop going to the washroom. And I was like, well, you don't, right? You continue to have bowel movements and urinate even while you're in the middle of a fast. To me, that there, there's some level of implication, like if you can reduce the, the maintenance that your digestive system has to do, it actually gets an opportunity to like tackle some of the backlog that might be sitting around because it's like well where does it come from the, the the system is obviously still going is does that hold water is that valid is that ridiculous yeah i think you make a good point so fasting let's talk about that first um fasting is a stressor right so if you are under other stressors significant stressors, I do not recommend fasting. So if you are also fighting an infection of some long-term chronic infection, now some infections you probably do want to fast while you're having them, but um, so there's caveats there and again, individualized. Um, but if you are under se severe psychological stress, if you're changing jobs, if you are moving, if something else like that, if you're in pain, do not fast. Um, wait until that stressor has passed because what fasting does is it's sort of this hormetic effect, right? It's where your your body now can have this like, dynamic ability to, to switch what it uses as fuel, typically from, from sugar to ketones or fats for fuel in the fasting process. Um, you know, your metabol metabolically things are shifting when you go into a fasting state. And even a ketogenic diet or a fasting diet, when you are using fats for fuel, you are that is essentially a detox diet. So you do start to mobilize toxins. Um, and so fasting isn't for everyone. It shouldn't be done when you're under other stressors. It should be done when you're, you know, things are relatively calm and, and taken care of. And then intermittent fasting is, I, I think, fantastic I th for some people. Again, like I said earlier, there's not one right diet for everyone forever. But intermittent fasting, I think, can be a great way to build resilience, which is kind of this idea of, of that hormetic effect is that you want to have that adaptive ability to, to respond to the dynamics in your environment or the changes in inputs. Um, and so that's kind of the fasting thing. Yes, love it, wonderful, give the gut a break. I think what you mentioned, like if that whole system can have a little break, then can it can it repair? Can it, can it start to function better? Can it get rid of some of the excess? Yes, you also affect the microbes, right? If you're fasting, if you're not feeding them sugar, if you're not feeding them all day, every day, then the microbial f milieu of your body is going to shift, of your gut. It, it, in particular. And so I think there's a ton of benefits from fasting. Um, and then this other piece that you had, like, well, are we getting rid of things that maybe like, should we be having bowel movements when you're, we're fasting? I typically recommend, um, you know, you can do water fasting. There are, there are some water faster, like salt water flushes where you just wait until what's coming out is just 
it's just clear fluid. Um, you know, some people incorporate colonics or even enemas. Um, fiber, I think, is a fantastic thing to have involved. So even if you did go to like a water fast, but you did water with some chia or water with some psyllium or water with some kind of fiber that could act as like a brush or a broom to go through the gut. And all of these things, um, again, it's really helpful to work with a doctor on or some kind of provider because there, it's not without risk. Right. So like a colonic, you have the risk of bowel perforation. There are there are things that can come up here. Um, so doing it with someone who can kind of hold your hand and walk you through it, I think, is important. But fasting, fasting lowers IGF-1. Like there's a lot of things that, like in terms of long term, like longevity, fasting is one of the things that has been proven over and over again to increase longevity. So incorporating that into either an annual or or you know, twice a year, once a year. I think that's a fantastic health, like very, very good for your health. Awesome. Uh, two things came up that I'd like to dig into. One, just really quickly, because this is a word I want in people's vocabulary everywhere. Uh, can you, can we actually define hormesis and like a uh, hormetic response? Because yeah. that's fantastic. And I want, I want that, I want that addressed. And then, um, I'd really love to get your opinion on where where you stand with the entire microbiome, gut health, second brain idea. Yeah. Okay. So hormesis is um, essentially the way that I think of it is that you're putting a stressor on the body. It like exercise is a great example. So the primary things where we can do this are are with exercise, with oxygen, with um, and then with with calories with food so what we're doing is we are putting our bodies in a in a stressed position or oh, in temperature like wim hof is a fantastic example of this so basically what we're trying to do is increase the ability of the system our bodies to be able to respond to the environment whether that's temperature or oxygen or food whatever it is so um if you were the way i usually presented to patients is like, if you go from your 77 degree office to your 77 degree car or your uh, to your 77 degree house, then if you try to go to Arizona in the summer or to Canada in the winter, your body isn't going to know what to do. But if we can take your body to Arizona for part of the day and to Canada in the winter for part of the day, then now when you do go into those different climates, those different environments, your body has the the ability to dis to respond. And that's essentially hormesis. It just like, exercise if you ask your body to do the work that's a stressor but now when you need to do the work when you need to run from the bear when you need to lift something heavy you have the ability to do it so that's essentially how i think of hormesis it's it's this increase in adaptive capacity and ability to respond to the environment um so fasting does that uh, there's I think that health can be defined that way, right? It's how much ability we have to respond and and maintain, you know, maintain some degree of comfort, right? Mm -hmm. So that's hormesis. Does that define it? Yeah, absolutely. To some degree? Like, Do you um, have additions to that? Uh, my my addition would be in the because again we've been we've been. On an overarching level, we've been speaking about kind of the transition from reactive to preventative and what you can actually do. And I think trying to apply hormesis into your life is super powerful, but it comes with a kind of asterisk, which is in the moment, they kind of suck. They're kind of yeah. difficult. That That's kind of the point. It's, it's a positive stress response, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I, I talk to people about what I do sometimes. Like, again, I love fasting, cold showers. We're big Wim Hof guys here, yeah. right? E sauna on the flip side, mm -hmm. right? Your point of going mm -hmm. to Arizona. Um, not totally fun when you're doing it, right? Like you're, you're hungry or you're cold or you're in an ice bath or whatever. But the idea being, it, it is like, you used the term earlier, it's like resilience training. It's actually like now I have this le base level of confidence that you'll put me anywhere, put me in whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Like I'm ready for it. And that's a very, it's a very empowering place to be. 
Absolutely. And it's a little addictive, right? <laughs> it's how you feel after. Yeah. Right? Like if you sauna, cold plunge, sauna, cold plunge, sauna, cold plunge, and then like you sleep so much better that night and yeah. you know, you feel invigorated and more engaged after. Um, it, it definitely is something that once you you get into it and kind of get up over it, um, it, it feels amazing. And a, a good little bit of peer pressure here can go a long way, right? Mm-hmm. If you've got a bunch of people cheering for you to jump into that cold plunge, um, that is helpful to get you up over the hump. So then the other piece that you wanted to talk about was, remind me. Uh, gut health, microbiome, um, this, uh, this notion, I've heard it presented like the second brain, all of, of this course. stuff. Yeah. So like there's more serotonin made in your gut than there is in your brain. So these neurotransmitters that there's neurotransmitter balance that our brain isn't just sending our gut signals, but our gut is sending our brain signals. And certainly we see this when I um, have a patient who comes in with a lot of anxiety and maybe they don't even have any GI complaints. They don't have diarrhea or constipation or heartburn or anything like that. And I always ask them to do a GI panel anyways. And I have been shocked at some of the things I've found. So no GI complaints, but tons of anxiety and clostridia is off the charts or uh, C. diff is off the charts. And they didn't know, they didn't, maybe they had a little bit of diarrhea here and there, but it wasn't like watery all day, every day, like you would think with C. diff. Um, This is a patient I actually just have had this last week or two. And so she has horrible OCD and anxiety and we haven't treated it yet, but I would not be surprised. Maybe it won't go to zero, but if a lot of her anxiety is de- basically um, is less debilitating when we address the gut microbe. So we see that over and over again. Um, and it, again, it's like what they're so linked. They're not inseparable. You cannot say one is causing the other. They're, they, they feed on each other. So if you have an imbalance in the gut microbiome, and that is causing some anxiety. Now the anxiety can contribute to a worse gut microbiome, right? Because you're, if you're not in a rest, digest, and heal state, then you're not going to create enough digestive enzymes. Now that you don't have enough, say, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, now you're not going to digest as well. And that is going to increase the ability of some of these less than savory bugs to continue to, to thrive in your gut. And so now you've got more anxiety because there's more of these microbes that can cause that. So it's not one or the other, but it's really, it's doing the meditation and fixing the, or I say fixing and I, I kind of, of try to avoid that because it's not about fixing. It's about creating balance, right? It's about um, going in the direction of, of, of balance and that not all, no one, we don't want anyone to be sterile, right? If your gut were sterile, that is the other end of, uh, of a big imbalance, uh, so overgrowth and then sterility would be the, or infection even, and then sterility would be the issues. And what we want is that nice balance of good, healthy flora. And we can measure it. So you can add things like, I really like Zach Bush's product and I'm sure you're familiar with it. The restore product, the, I, I think he calls it ion now, but that's a great one for helping with leaky gut and glutamine, aloe, deglycerinated licorice. There's a lot of things people can do to help with the gut. I basically think of this as in um, there's four or five components depending on what's going on for you, but healing the leaky gut, which I, I don't even test for it anymore. I just assume everybody has it. Some degree of inflammation, stress, history of antibiotic use, eating gluten. Most people have, have that can say yes to some of those things. And those are the things that typically cause leaky gut. So if you have some inflammation then in the gut, then that's going to cause those cells to swell. Now there's space in between them. And so adding glutamine, aloe, DGL, that ion product, um, there's probably others for leaky gut that maybe I'm less familiar with, but that's where I start. And then adding digestive enzymes, particularly if anxiety and depression is a part of the story where people can't get into that rest, digest, and heal state. And then um, probiotics. Now, this the caveat here is I believe you need to do high doses with food. Um, And you'll get different people that say different things, but a friend of mine did her PhD in basically how to get 
probiotics to colonize the gut. And she said a hundred billion per dose and with food, because that's how they're most likely to get into the intestines through that high acid in the stomach. And then as frequently as possible, but usually have people start with one a day. Now, if you have SIBO, this can be very uh, triggering. So people can end up with a lot of painful gas and bloating with too high of a dose of probiotics or really any probiotics or fermented foods. So going slow there if you feel like you have SIBO or if someone's told you you have SIBO. Um, and then fiber. Fiber is so essential just to keeping things moving, to helping with good gut microbes. It, it feeds them. So this sort of pro, prebiotic, probiotic um, idea. So having all of those components um, present can be super helpful. And there's other things like butyrate can be very helpful for enterocytes. There's a lot of things that we could discuss, colostrum, vitamin D, vitamin A for increasing secretory IgA. So having that, that gut immune response capable um, to, of fighting things as, as we're introduced to them. The gut is how we're introduced to a lot of microbes, right, is in terms of what we eat. So having a good ability of your immune system to be able to respond to that, to fight off whatever might be necessary um, is important. And so a secretory IgA is how we measure that ability. Yeah, and that was such a, that was a beautiful illustration of what I touched on earlier, this notion of like the, the downward spiral or the vicious circle, where it's like you get anxious, it affects your gut, that goes back, increases anxiety, the increases in anxiety, messes with your gut more, and then you're you're stuck in this loop. And it was nice that you just basically touched on like, A, recognize this, B, start on both. Like it's not a, it's not a if or, it's like, or it's not a, yeah, either or. It's like, well, okay, are there things you can do to reduce your stress levels like in your head? And are there things you can do to actually help with your gut? And just chip away at both like it's actually just a kind of pick where you want to start and go do that and if you chip away at both then you actually make some some really strong progress uh in that area and i love the i love the point i think it's the sympathetic to parasympathetic switch and again on the surface like this can all sound clinical it can all sound like very scientific but it's like make a meditation practice go for walks in nature like there's a reason yoga has existed for so long like these practices actually are very useful to help you do that and you can take it on the frame of like this is helping my mental emotional state or you can take it on like this is actually a physiological beneficial response that these things induce like that's amazing that's like whichever whichever way you want to look at it there are not too overwhelming steps to take that can actually chip away at this. And so if I've, if I've been sitting here listening to us go on this entire time and I'm actually like, okay, I'm in, like, let me do something. I at least want to see where I'm at. I, I at least want to see how I can get better. It seems like the first step they should take is a, go talk to someone who knows what they're speaking about. If that, if they take that, what would you, what would you want them to look at? Like, is this, does it, does all this stuff come from like a blood panel? Should I yeah, do? Yeah, great question. Like what so, comes next? Yeah, so I go back to those five causal factors. If I and Dr. Bredesen, he calls it a cognoscopy. So, <laughs> so like you know, people over fifty, you're supposed to go get a colonoscopy, make sure you don't have colon cancer, right? What we would say is let, let's do a cognoscopy, let's do a full thorough workup and see if there are imbalances in these causal factors so we can get ahead of them. So I would want to look at all three of those flavors of toxins. So and we can run all those in panels. So heavy metals, mycotoxins, and the chemical toxins. And then yeah, we do a blood panel. So um, a full blood panel would include a CBC, CMP, which is what your your regular doctor would run, a complete blood, blood count, and then a complete metabolic panel, um, but also your nutrients like vitamin D, B vitamins, um, minerals, look at amino acids even, um, an oat panel, an organic acid test, it's sort of like the metabolomics and those I never use for like diagnostic purposes, but to sort of triangulate and get a good sense of what's going on. Um, a, a stool panel, like we talked about, even for people who don't complain about GI issues because like we just discussed that can show up in so many different areas um, particularly with mental health so knowing if there's a, a big imbalance there is important um, and then 
hormones of course that would come in a in a blood panel um and then an infectious panel right now i'm running the cyrex array 12 this changes because of cost uh, you know kind of depending on what's coming in um what i'm trying to look at when we look for infections we have to ask the question do you have strep not what are all of the potential bacteria that could be growing in your throat so um we have to decide what are the ones that would m give us the most information that would be actionable. Um, and again, we're not sterile. So some things may be growing there and that would be good. Other things may be growing there and that would be bad. And my panel for that shifts, like I would run an Igenix if you had been bitten by a tick and had some sort of Lyme or potentially Lyme related symptoms. So, but we basically are going back to that that model of what are all of the causal things. So nutrients, I want to have a nutrient panel. I want to have toxin panels. I want to have genetic structure. Um, I don't run a ton of this because I think that we're going to get more out of it in five or 10 years than I do right now. And it can kind of be a rabbit hole that doesn't always benefit people. But, it, you know, certainly if you have a lot of history of cancer in your family, then you want to know if you have Lynch syndrome or a BRCA status. Um, so, so that would be something worth, worth discussing with a provider. Um, really depending, that's, that's sort of the foundation of what I would run. And then depending on what's going on for you, we may do more or less, uh, in one area, like if infections are super relevant, then we'll do that. And then if like a traumatic brain injury is relevant, then we would run an, EK, an EEG, um, and it really depends after that what's going on with you. Um, we Again, it's individualized. And then once we get that back, we might want to dig deeper into certain areas. And so how does the, I guess for lack of a better term, how does the biohacking world fit into this? Like, would you, would you have someone be like, oh yeah, the aura sleep ring is going to be useful or you should be counting your steps or like, is there... Where do you where do you sit with that? Is that yeah, useful? So I use the Garmin VivoFit Four. That's what I use. Um, it, we for the study at my office on cognitive decline. That's what we're using, and so I needed to be familiar with it. And our team, um, the research team, tried a few different things, and um, we felt like that product was a little bit more accurate than the Aura Ring, um, and it's also less expensive. Don't get me wrong, the Aura Rings, I'm sure it's great, and for a lot of people, it's easier to wear than a, a bracelet or a watch. Um, so that's what I use personally. That's what we use in my clinic and what I typically recommend for people. It measures pulse ox at night, which has such a big impact on cognitive function and how much oxygen gets to our brain at night. If we have periods of time when our oxygen is dropping, that can be very detrimental. So I want to get a signal for that early on so that I can refer people to sleep studies or get them a CPAP or do whatever needs to be done um, to, to treat that right away. So yeah, in terms of devices, oh, there's so many I love. Like I love the Juve Light. The there's a um, the Violet Gamma for cognitive function is working really well on a handful of patients I have, and then the Livo Two, uh, the adaptive contrast oxygen therapy, which comes up with the hormetic effect. Um, so stressing your body under work with oxygen availability is really really helpful. Um, can be and so yeah there's a ton of devices that i love getting to play with even the biomat i've seen work really well for people so there's um there's all of my endorsements <laughs> awesome awesome i want to i want to kind of look towards the future if i this is actually a two-part one is and maybe so long as you can speak about this and there's there's nothing you can't talk about where would you like to see neurohacker go and like showing up and um you know <laughs> if i gave you if i gave you the ability to set health directives for the united states what would you what would you like to see done what would you like to see changed the food system mm -hmm. yeah number one would be the food system um access to good healthy whole foods is foundational so if we don't have that, if people are eating Fruit Loops for breakfast and, you know, whatever, bologna for lunch, then they are not going to be healthy. Um, so 
yeah, changing the dynamics of the food system where healthy foods are available and affordable and there is time in our day to prepare them um, and that society really values that. I think that that's key to, to the shift. And I, there's a lot of people doing some really amazing work with children in schools, getting, you know, gardens and schools and having children in, involved in preparing good, healthy foods. I think that is critical and key in there. We could spend much, much less on that and get way better outcomes than fighting end stage disease, keeping people alive when they have chronic complex diseases um, at the end. So that's what I would start. That's where I would start. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I want to bring back the, the neurohacker point. Like yeah. what, what would you like to see come next? You know, I'm so impressed obviously by Daniel um, and, and James and, and Jordan and the crew here that they have an uncanny ability to adapt again this you know this hormetic effect they get to whatever the situation is um and and i would really like to he see their voices um amplified um the the notion that we can live in a compassionate society that values the, both the individual and the collective um, where we can each attain our full potential um, is is the direction we want to go, right? The, and for for that message to be amplified, um, and then for it to to take shape, for it to start to manifest. Um, and I think you know that's what Neurohacker Collective is, right? There, there's everyone who works here. That's that's the premise is that we all are able to reach our full potential, that we do it in a compassionate, loving environment where we're supported. Um, and, and then of course there are these pieces that we, I, you know, obviously the, the products are there to support these ideas and, and also so that people might have that ability to engage and the ability to, to give their gifts, but the products are not the end goal, right? It's the societal change that I think is, is the end goal yeah you know <laughs> we, we we definitely are overlapping here when i first saw um some of the things that jordan and daniel were coming out with there was a part of me that was i don't want to say frustrated but almost confused as to well these guys can think and operate on levels i actually haven't seen in many people before mm -hmm. it's actually kind of wild mm -hmm. and i was like well and they're doing nootropics like they're doing supplement company like why why is that <laughs> and then almost reluctantly I've, I've actually once i started asking that i noticed that shift in in my own life recently where you know right out of school i did the tech startup san francisco world i was like tech's gonna save the world it, everything's gonna be amazing and then i was it, it started coming up where it's like look if we're giving really powerful tools to people who are still getting triggered by stuff we're going to have a problem. Like it's not, it's not going to go well. We can't be giving grown up children, big boy toys. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I don't want to say reluctantly, but clearly I keep coming with that word where it's like, Oh, we actually have to start earlier in this process. We actually need the capable collective before we even give them any tools or any problems to work on. Because to this whole conversation, that is the foundation. Like a functional society is built on functional, capable individuals and so yeah we're that's why again neurohacker has resonated so much with us on this team both because mm -hmm. in a space that can be sometimes have science almost manipulated there there are a lot of weird kind of rogue act not rogue actors but just not too interests. developed yeah 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 there's, there's a lot of interests at play mm -hmm. there's money to be made and then to actually have such a comprehensive, actually capable piece pieces and products coming out from Neurohacker is a, a, a light in the dark. It's very beautiful mm -hmm. to see. But yeah, there is just this, there is just a sense like, okay, we'll, we'll solve whatever we need to solve if we can all show up at the table. Mm -hmm. And so it's what do we actually need to do so that we can all show up at the table here. Precisely. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to speak to on that point? Actually, how do we get people to show up at the table? 
Like I said, you know, I feel my contribution to that is making sure that they're as healthy as possible. So whoever wants a seat at that table, that they can, they can fully show up, that they're not distracted by pain or, you know, needing to run to the bathroom, whatever it is. Um, and Daniel and Jordan are collecting other individuals who have other pieces to, to contribute. Um, and I, I'm just so excited to see what they come up with. You know, the context of this whole coronavirus thing, I was just really awed by how they were able to pivot to like, okay, what can we do? What can we do to help? What can we do in a, in a thoughtful, comprehensive, smart way to bring the right people together, to put the right information in front of the right people? And, um, and I, I was just awed by how quickly and determined, how quickly they were able to do it and how determined they were to, to just make it happen. Um, whenever I'm in a room with Daniel, all of the, it takes a minute, but all of the sort of obstacles kind of clear. And it's like, no, they, there's really nothing standing in our way. Just, just go do it. Just go do it. We can get the people. We can get what the financial piece, like it can all come together and big things can happen. Yeah, it's such a that that illustrates the entire point actually that you put the right people in the room when they're ready to go and w it will come together. It's mm -hmm. actually it's it's almost inevitable, but it starts yeah. it starts with that core group of people. Um so I I want to give one shout out and then I want to ask you where people can follow along with you, but if you if you really found this interesting and want to dig in more to this Heather hosts an entire podcast dedicated to the nitty gritty of this. And there is a lot. There have been some fantastic guests. Um, I would strongly make a recommendation for the Collective Insights podcast. It really digs into the weeds, but also keeps up this frame of, all right, what is the goal of this? What are we actually trying to do here? Um, how can we move forward? So, a, do you want to speak to that a bit? Or B, where can people find and follow you if they want to follow along with what you're doing? Yeah, so my clinic is North County Natural Medicine and the residential care facility for the elderly where we create an immersive experience in this type of medicine is called Marama and is maramaexperience.com. And then Collective Insights, of course, as you know, hosting a podcast is just one of the great privileges. I get to talk to you know, people I have just essentially worshipped, like someone like Andrew Weil. Uh, it was just such an amazing uh, just opportunity to be able to pick the brains of people I have had so much respect for for so long who have really shaped this conversation and been um, been a light showing us, shining me, shining the way for me. And so uh, just an absolute, like, fun and um, one of the highlights of my weeks is getting to interview these really incredible minds um so yeah collective insights and um and neurohacker of course there's a ton of information not just in the podcast but like you had mentioned the foundations for neurohacking there's so much great information that's um that's written there if you consume information better in writing and um, and also lots of information about Eternus and Qualia and how those might be beneficial. And there's immune products and sleep products that we're excited about uh, that I think plug the gaps in what's available on the market right now and will hopefully get people some relief and, again, get them at the table. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, there's actually a lot of um, the blog on Neurohacker has been really useful for me because, you know, I, I think for some of us, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, I know GABA is a neurotransmitter. I know like acetylcholine and all this stuff. But like, if someone presses me on that, what does this do? How does this act? There, there's a little, a little shakiness there. So there's actually a lot of really nice, yeah, I would almost call them introductory materials to actually make the case of why these are important, what you can do with them. Um, so yeah, just another plug there. Um, wow, this was really good. I think oh, people yeah. are going to get a lot out of this, I or at least so. I really hope so. Because again, I think it's worth banging this drum one more time is like, we've been talking a lot about foundations and actually building a solid foundation and physical body and brain health are the foundation of your life, right? Almost by definition, right? When they stop functioning, you stop functioning, depending on your metaphysical orientation. So like they are, they are the foundation that the rest of your life is built from your relationships, your career, your just subjective state of wellness. So 
take it seriously. It'll mm-hmm. it'll come together. And like like I said a little earlier, like if you want to tackle some anxiousness, some brain fog, like instead of looking for pills, looking for the quick solution, like dude, foundations. Go outside, <laughs> get some fresh air, move your body, sleep. Um so yeah, honestly this was a real pleasure. And I actually I feel the same way right in this moment about podcast hosting and being able to meet people that you really admire because I've listened to you for quite some time and to actually be able to see and speak to you has been a real pleasure Eric it's been so fun for me thank you for having me awesome well I will put all those links in the show notes uh, so you guys can dig in deeper and we will see you back for the next one thank you for hanging out with us for this long and uh, yeah go be healthy Thank you so much for being here. That was a big one, but it was overflowing with a lot of tactical, practical suggestions on how to take your health into your own hands. Health has been on our minds a lot this year. It's been a very trying year here in 2020. And so if you know anyone who could benefit from this, who you think might enjoy it, can you take just a minute and pass this episode along to them? It could go a long way. If you found value in this, it would be incredibly helpful if you could go give a rating and a review on wherever you're listening to this. And it's really not too much to ask for that after this masterclass in human physiology right there from Heather. With all that said, thank you, I love you, and I will see you again soon for the next episode.